welcome to worship this morning. Glad you all are here. If you're watching us online, welcome to you as well. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for all who have prioritized, Lord, this gathering together this morning. Lord, thank you because you have us walk with you every day. You promise to guide us, to lead us. Lord, we say openly that we depend on you and that we trust you completely with our lives. So as we surrender this morning in adoration, Lord, we ask that you would by your Holy Spirit move in our lives and inspire our hearts today. Lord, we ask that you would fill our lives with your love, our conversations with your grace and truth, Lord, in our gathering this morning with your presence. And we ask this all for your glory. Amen. Go ahead and join me in standing. Let me just say, uh, we all need to be prioritizing the memorization of God's word. Would you all agree? Uh, I would emphasize even more so, parents, don't be afraid to like, have your kids memorize scripture. When I was young, I don't even remember, uh, I think I was probably seven or eight at the time, my mom had me memorize the entirety of Psalm 103, and it was painful, I promise you. It was painful, there were many tears shed. Uh, but fast forward, I don't wanna say how many years, I love this passage, it's one of my favorite Psalms in all of the Psalms, the book of Psalms. It, it's one that has meant the most to me, probably because I was most familiar with it. And this verse right here, it says, Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And there's so much wrapped up in this, this phrase, bless the Lord, because it's a calling for us, but it's also a command at the same time to bless the Lord, not just with your mouth, but with your life. Bless the Lord, O my soul, with all of my being. And we get to do that, not just with our lives, but together this morning as we start off our service by singing all creatures of our God. So let's sing this together and bless the Lord as First Baptist Church.
our soul. What a privilege to be able to worship with you guys this morning. You'll see on the, real quickly on the screen where we are with our giving as of last week. And uh, you'll see in, on the next screen where you're able to give online since we're not passing the plate in person. You can go to give.fbcmich.org. There's different drop-down menu on there to choose specifically either to the general fund or towards a specific gift you can, you can choose. There's also in there the deacon fund as well if you'd like to give to that as well. Otherwise, if you choose to give physically, there is a box right outside the annex door. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, thanking for the giving of the church this morning. Father, Lord, we praise you for the blessing in our lives to be able to bless you with everything that we have. Lord, there is faithfulness here in this church when it comes to giving, and I want to give you the glory for that, because it is by your power and by your working in our lives that that is true and that has come to pass. We want to acknowledge that you are Lord over everything, including our finances. We thank you for the faithfulness of your church here. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship and song this morning. Let's sing together, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Our congregational reading this morning is going to be one verse. So let's read it all together up on the screen. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his truth in our hearts as a guarantee. It's a wonderful comfort to know that my salvation is not dependent on me, because I would lose it. Absolutely, wouldn't take long. We are thankful to Jesus Christ, our Savior, because in him, as our song, next song says, our hope remains immovable. Let's sing that truth together this morning. Immovable our hope remains, though sifting sands before us lie.
take a couple minutes right now for personal and quiet prayer before the message this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have come, Lord, to bless your name for everything that you are. Lord, we recognize that we do it imperfectly, but we also recognize, Lord, that we have a Savior on which we stand firmly because without him we have nothing. And the best we have to offer you and ourselves is filthy rags. So we thank you for Jesus Lord, who is our immovable hope in this shifting world and culture, society. We thank you for a firm place to stand. And Lord, let us let that humble us as we approach you this morning. Lord, as we're about to hear the word preached, Lord, let that humble us and bring us to a place of recognition of our need of continual change and continual work. Lord, as Pastor Pete comes to bring your word that he has poured over and prayed over and studied through this week, Lord, I pray that you would Lord, bless him as he preaches. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for his faithfulness to the text, Lord, to the, Lord, the original word that you've given to us. Lord, let us be faithful listeners, active listeners, engaging. And Lord, through your spirit, I pray that you work in our lives. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Join me in standing. This next song, we're about to sing the last one before the message. I have a bit of an odd challenge for you. I don't know if many of you, many of you guys are like me. I'm easily distracted uh, with my eyes when I, I'm like singing worship. I, if you can, this song we're about to sing is very much a prayer. Absolutely. If you need to see the words on the screen, by all means, I'm not saying you can't look, but if you can, sing this song with your eyes closed and just talk with God while you're singing this song. Because this song reads, O great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. This is very much a prayer to God. So if you're able to sing this song as a prayer, whatever that means to you, if that means close your eyes, do it. I'm going to for the first verse. I have to see the music for the second one. But either if you can, sing this song from your heart, O great God of highest heaven.
At this time, children, you may be dismissed to your class. Before I um, preach, uh, we do have one announcement. Uh, Ken James is going to come up and share an announcement of a ministry opportunity that we've done before, and it's a great opportunity, and so I, I just ask that you give him your attention and uh, uh, opportunity that every single person in here can and should be involved in. Takes me a little time to get up here, but uh, we'll make it. Uh, there are some new members in the church that uh, may not be familiar with this program, but uh, we started, like the pastor said, a, f a few years ago. Um, whoops. We get a charge out of that, drop the battery. Um, we ask that people take a prayer card. I got some here. Uh, we have a, a deal where a few years ago police officers really had target on their back and there was lots and lots of people, police officers being shot and uh, I got the burden to pray for these police officers so we pray for Mitchell Walker, uh, police officers and what I'm asking you to do is if you take a card, we've got a table set up here in the back if you'll take a card and agree to pray daily for the officer that's on your card. And uh, you'll sign the card, uh, there's two of them, and, and you'll sign both of them, and uh, give them back to us. We're gonna take them and have them laminated like a, uh, like a driver's license or, or something, so, so they'll stand up. One card will come back to you, the other card will go to the officer, and then the officer, we, we've had some folks in our church that have pulled up beside an officer's car and roll their window down and say, you know, we're at the church that prays for you. And the officer reached up and pulled a card off the sun visor and said, yes, I know, you're praying for me. And uh, so it does make a difference. But if you're gonna do it, you're going to agree to pray daily for that officer. And then when we get these ready to go, we take them and give them to the officer along with a snack box. So there's all kinds of goodies in here. We're looking for volunteers to buy these snacks. There's all kinds of things in here, little packets of chips, lifesavers, gum, things of that nature that they can put in their car along with, we're, this year we're including a cup uh, that's got the church's name on it and a pen that we've ordered that they can carry in their pocket or their squad car, and it says, your prayer partner who is praying for you at First Baptist Church. So uh, we just ask that you would uh, like to stop by the table at the back of the annex and uh, pull off this card out of the box, sign your name, give them back to us right now so that we can take them and get them laminated, and then you'll get them back. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ken, and I do encourage you to be involved with that. Um, I know it doesn't matter in here what age you are. Um, I know that when we've done this in the past, even my kids have gotten involved, and so um, I encourage you to uh, get those, pray for them, and uh, it'll be a blessing to you. One, I know for me what I did was when I, uh, I would put it in my car, so every time I got in my car, I would see the name of the individual and I would pray right then. Uh, as I was driving around, if I would see a police officer as I was dri driving, I would stop and pray for my police officer. So uh, just a way that we can be uh, involved in, in supporting um, these um, public servants. So take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Uh, before we begin, I do have, um, I just, I want to take some time to pray. Um, some of you may have heard this, but uh, Carmen uh, uh, Borst, who used to be Carmen Foster, that is uh, Rich and Julie Long's granddaughter. Uh, her husband was in a uh, car accident this week, and he uh, broke his uh, neck and uh, is, had a concussion. He's in the hospital, so just be in prayer for him. And also, I know there are some individuals in our church whose parents are not doing well health-wise, 
And so uh, I also know there are a number of people sick, uh, so I know there's probably more watching online today than normal, so it's good to have you with us here as well. But let's just pray for these as we uh, look into God's Word as well. God, we are thankful that uh, we can come to you with our requests, and Lord, I do pray for uh, Tate uh, and the, the accident that he experienced. I pray that you will heal his body and that he'll recover quickly from this, and thankfully it wasn't worse than uh, it was and what it could have been, and so Lord, I pray you heal his body. Lord, I do know there's uh, those in our church whose uh, parents are struggling physically and don't really even know how much time that they have on this earth. I pray that you will uh, work in their bodies, relieve them from pain, uh, and have this, whatever time you have for them, to be a great time for family, uh, to just spend time with them. Lord, I do also pray for those that are sick. I know there are numerous in our church that are homesick today. Uh, I pray that you'll heal their bodies as well. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, uh, God, that you will strengthen me, that you will make your word clear. We ask that you are glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verse 18. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Luke today. Um, and then next week, uh, we're going to transition to Christmas, which means we'll probably also be in the book of Luke some. But we're going to transition to Christmas themes uh, we're going to be singing Christmas songs starting next week, and uh, so encourage you to be back over the next three weeks as we uh, look at uh, the story of Christmas. Uh, Luke chapter 7, and I want to start off by asking, um, do you ever struggle with trusting in God? Think about that. Let me view, uh, word it just a little bit differently. Do you ever wrestle with doubt? I think that doubt is something that's not talked about much. In fact, I think that, and I, I remember as a kid, like, I struggled with doubts at times of different things, and I remember I was afraid to tell anyone because I thought people would look down on me. Uh, and I, I, but I think that the reality is, if we're honest, if we're, if we're transparent, that from time to time, <clears throat> every believer struggles with doubt. And, and, and how uh, can, well, at times we'll go through questions like, can Christianity be true? What if I put all my hopes in Christ and, and it's wrong? What if there's really no heaven or hell? What if the Bible isn't true? And, and questions of these sort can, can nag at us and they can, they can haunt us even at times. And they can cause us to begin to doubt even more. And today we're going to look at a hero of faith. We're going to look at a man who was a man of great faith, and yet we're going to see that he was someone who struggled with doubts. His name was John the Baptist. Doubt, I think, is one of the darkest secrets of the church, and I believe we all doubt. I know I have. And I think, I think that doubt can be a hard thing, but I don't think doubt is automatically something that's sinful or wrong. Uh, and I think that doubt can be something that actually leads to growth if we allow it to. I think doubts fall into three categories. And let me go through those and tell you uh, wh what I mean by them. Okay, first of all, I think there could be intellectual doubt. What does that mean? There are doubts that are raised, uh, those outside of the Christian faith. Things like, is the Bible true? You know, we'll hear those things bombarded at us all the time. Is the Bible true? Did miracles really happen? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Those are intellectual doubts that are debated all the time. Then there are spiritual doubts. Those are doubts that tend to be those that are here today, inside the church. Am I really a Christian? That's probably a big one. Why is it so hard to pray? Why is it that I feel guilty even though the Bible says I'm forgiven? Those are spiritual doubts. The final category is what I call circumstantial doubts. And I believe this is the biggest category because it covers the, the big why questions of life. Things like, why did my child die? Why did my marriage break up? Why did my friend betray me? Why can't I find a spouse? Where was God when my uncle abused me? Why am I struggling with il this illness? 
when the questions go on and on. These are the questions that often are the toughest doubts. These are the questions that really honestly, if we think about it and if we're honest about it, these are questions that, that, we cause, that cause us to, to think on a regular basis. Why am I going through this trial? God, why did you allow this? We go through these doubts, and, and when we refuse to deal with doubts, what they're going to do is they're going to lead to greater doubts. And, and I believe that these circumstantial doubts lead to spiritual doubts, which ultimately lead to intellectual doubts. And eventually, if we're not careful, what happens is, is it leads us to abandoning the faith and leaving the church. Why is it that people leave the church? Oftentimes, if not all the times, it's because they didn't deal with doubts. Doubts popped up in their life, and instead of dealing with them, what they did was they just allowed those doubts to fester, and it caused more problems. And what we're going to find in this passage is that Jesus dealt with someone who was doubting in a way that was gentle and kind and truthful. So let's look at this passage it's a long passage, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it in chunks, okay, as we go along. And, uh, and, and so, but in doing this, I want to deal with this topic of doubt. And so the first thing I want to notice is that difficult circumstances increase our vulnerability to doubt. Look at the passage, starting in uh, chapter 7, verse 18. It says in verse 18, the disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, reported all these things. What is all these things? All these things refers to uh, all the miracles that Jesus has been performing, all the messages that Jesus has been teaching. The disciples of John came and told John about them. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? We look in this passage, and, then, and, and we see as it continues on, verse 21, In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And, and he said to them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. I remember one time um, this is, uh, that I ran into someone that I hadn't seen in years. And they walked up to me and they said, are you who I think you are? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? I don't know. Am I? Who do you think I am? Okay, and, and, and that's kind of what John did here is that he, he sent his disciples, his followers to Jesus and he says to the, them, go ask Jesus if he's who we're expecting. Now, we got to remember, where is John at this point? Uh, it doesn't tell us in this passage, but at this point, John is in, in the dungeon. He is one, in one of the most hideous prisons of, of that time. He is in a place and he is suffering because he, con he condemned Herod's sin of marrying, his, uh, wrongly marrying his one-time sister-in-law Herodias. And so because he condemned Herod, he was thrown into prison. And so John is agonizing in prison. And as he's agonizing in prison, from time to time, his disciples would come and they would tell him about what's going on in the world. And they would tell him about Jesus and Jesus healing people and Jesus uh, 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 preaching and Jesus talking about things that like blessed are the poor and Jesus talking about those that are persecuted are going to be blessed. I mean, uh, things like that. And I think what, as, as these are coming to John, John begins to go, wait a second. Because if you le read back, and we talked about this uh, a few months ago, but if you read back earlier in Luke, when, what, what talks about John's message, John's message was one of repentance because what he said was, is that the Messiah was going to come with fire. What does that mean? That means that John's assumption was that Jesus Christ was going to come and he was going to overthrow Rome because fire refers to judgment. And so here's John hearing these messages about, oh, Jesus did what? 
Jesus said, what? Now remember, John had baptized Jesus, and when he baptized Jesus, he said, behold the Lamb of God. And yet, here he is now, sometime later, <laughs> hiding away in a dungeon, hearing reports about Jesus, not doing what he thought Jesus was supposed to be doing. And he was perplexed by that. Basically, in his mind, Jesus was not living up to his expectations. And isn't that most of us when, when doubt comes? Isn't that? I mean, you're, you're, you're going along life just great. And then suddenly you lose your job. God, why'd you do this? What is it? Your expectation is that he would, he would allow you to continue to have your job. And when he takes it away, you say, wait, wait a second. And that doubt starts kicking in. You go to the doctor one day and the doctor says, hey, there's a problem. We need to run some tests and tests come back. Yes, you have cancer. God, why? I thought you were all powerful. I thought you were sovereign. And these doubts begin to kick in. And here's where John is at. He's disappointed, he's disillusioned, he's doubting. And so he sends two of his disciples to Jesus and asks the simple question, are you the one who, uh, who is to come or, or are you not him? Are we still looking for him? Now, I, wanna, I want you to understand something. There is a huge gap between doubt and unbelief. See, doubt happens when we don't understand what God is doing. Unbelief takes place when we refuse to believe God. And what John is struggling with here is not, is not unbelief. He's struggling with doubt. Uh, Oswald Chambers said it this way. He said, doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be just a sign that he's thinking. And I love how Jesus responds. Look at verse 21 again. And, and it says, in that hour, and it, it, he performs all of these miracles. He heals people and he, he uh, uh, removes the evil spirits and he gives blind their, their, their sight. And he, he doesn't initially respond. When they come and they ask, are you the one? Are we looking for someone? He doesn't look and address them right away. Instead, he goes and, and he heals. Now, how do we respond when someone doubts us, questions our motives, our integrities, our integrity. I think a lot of times we might get angry or we might get frustrated, but Jesus then responds uh, kindly. And what Jesus does is, is this. Jesus taught at this moment that God's word is the cure for doubt. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, I think, I think when we are going through uh, uh, life and we struggle to doubt anything or, or we just struggle in life, we need to learn that God's word is always the cure. There, there are uh, very few of us that crack the Bible open on a regular basis, or I shouldn't say very few. There are some who've never cracked the Bible open on a regular basis. I remember when I was a youth pastor, uh, oftentimes I would have a young person come to me and say, I'm doubting my salvation. And I would say to them, uh, okay, what have you been reading in your Bible? Well, well, I haven't read my Bible in a long time. Well, there you go. Maybe that's why you're struggling with doubt. When we are struggling with anything, we need to be diving into the Word. And we wonder why uh, we have people who struggle constantly with fear and anger and stress and anxiety and discouragement and because we're not in God's word. We're not trusting his promises. You're maybe thinking, how, how is God's word the cure for doubt? And what does that have to do anything with this passage? Well, we need to understand kind of the behind the scenes stuff. And so in verse 21, when, when they ask the question in verse 20, and Jesus in verse 21 doesn't say a word, but he heals and he performs all these miracles. And then verse 22, he says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. And then he and then, he then rehearses it. He says, what have you seen and heard? He says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. You say, what does that mean? 
See, in these miracles, and specifically what Jesus told John's disciples to tell him, were a fulfillment of prophetic passages from out the Old Testament. Passages like this, in Isaiah, when it talks about the Messiah coming, it says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Or passage like this in Isaiah that Luke also references earlier in this book that we looked at, it says, the spirit of the Lord is, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken heart and proclaim liberty to the captives and to open the prison to those who are bound. And so what he is saying, what, uh, what Jesus is saying is, go back to John and tell John to remember what he learned. See, John and Jesus both had incredible understanding of the Old Testament. And, and they would have read it, they would have studied it, they would have memorized it. And so by these miracles, what Jesus is simply saying is, go tell John that everything that Isaiah promised would happen when the Messiah came is happening because I'm the Messiah. And what he's basically saying to him is, hey, you're struggling to doubt I am him? Study the word. And I think that's true for us in any doubt that we have. That we, that we study the word and say, okay, God, I, I, I'm not sure why this is going on. I'm just going to study the word. Second thing I want you to notice is God's word is the cure for doubt, but also it expresses in here God's mission. God's mission. Look at uh, uh, the end of verse 22. It says, uh, the poor have received the good news preached to them. This is important. Why is this important? And I think this is, this, Jesus emphasized this for a reason. Because uh, uh, the healing diseases, the restoring the sight, the casting out demons, even the raising of the dead is nothing without the gospel. It's nothing without the good news of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it is, the, the good news of Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ came to earth, that Jesus Christ died, that Jesus Christ rose again. That's the good news. And what he's saying here in this passage is all of those things point to that, but the good news is, is what's most ultimately important. And it reminds us of the fact that the church's mission is not, uh, you know, doing good deeds for people. Okay, even, even when, when Ken came up and talked about these baskets, I, I love doing these baskets, but the point of these is to, to give an opportunity to share the gospel. That's the point. The church's mission is not food banks, soup kitchens, free clothes, sports leagues, or even fellowships. Our mission is the gospel. And that's what Jesus was emphasizing. He's emphasizing the fact that, hey, the good news was preached. Uh, we're to be sharing the gospel. We're to be making disciples. The, the world doesn't need uh, more social problem, programs. It needs rescue programs. And there's nothing wrong with humanitarian service. But in the end, the end game of those is to bring sinners to an understanding of the gospel. And so God's message is to preach the gospel. Thirdly, God's blessing of trusting even in doubt. Look at verse 23, and he says something interesting there. And he, as he's talking uh, here, he says, And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now, who's he talking to here? One might say he's talking, saying this for John, but I think John believed, but he was struggling with doubt. Um, I, I think maybe here he's talking to John's disciples. They came, they maybe were a little skeptical. They're like, hey, John sent us and we don't understand what's going on here. Are you actually who you say you are? From everything John has told us, we don't think so. And, and Jesus says this phrase, he says, uh, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now, that, that phrase, not offended my, by me, is an interesting phrase. Uh, in, in the Greek, it actually is a phrase that means this. It says, not to be scandalized by me. In other words, what it's saying is, is, blessed is the one who doesn't look at me as a scandal, doesn't think I'm a scandal, and, and looks at me and says, hey, it's not causing me to stumble. And he's saying there to John's disciples, uh, don't be trapped, don't be ensnared by this, but trust. So doubt, 
uh, is, is a problem. Second thing we want to look at is doubt does not disqualify a servant of God. This is an interesting uh, section here because John is doubting. But how does Jesus deal with John? Look what it says next. Follow along as I read verse 24. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in the king's court. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare the way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one, is, the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Now, I'm sure that you've read that before and went, what is he talking about? Well, let me explain. In this passage, uh, John's disciples have gone back to give John the, the report that Jesus gave to them. And, and I'm thinking that what happened is, is as they went away, Jesus is sensing that those who heard their words might, might begin to question the authentic nature of John's ministry. They might begin to think, well, are, are you saying John is, is, is a problem here? Are you questioning John? And so John, I mean, excuse me, so Jesus affirms John. I mean, notice what he says in verse 28. I read that. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is none greater than John. That's high praise, right? I mean, if someone said that, hey, there's no one in this world greater than this person, you would think, oh, wow, that person must be pretty special. Essentially, Jesus is saying to those, uh, saying this to those listening, that he's saying, I'm giving John the benefit of the doubt despite John's doubt. We see a few things under this. First of all, John is worthy of Jesus' praise. He says this little, this little uh, paragraph here in, in, in verse uh, 24 and 25, uh, and he, he talks about the wilderness. What is that referring to? That is referring to that, remember when John preached, John preached in the wilderness. The wilderness is not necessarily what you and I might think of. When we think of the wilderness, we might think of like a, a beautiful forest. You go out in the forest. The wilderness that you're talking about here is, is basically like a desolate wasteland. And so he says to them, they all, all, a lot of people went out to hear John preach in the wilderness. He says, why did you go to the wilderness? What was your reason for going to the wilderness? And he gives them a few options. The first one he says there is, uh, did, did you go out there, uh, look, look what he says in verse 24, did you go out there to see a reed shaken by the wind? Saying, what does that mean? Okay, the reeds were uh, like long grasses that would just flow around and bounce around. And he's saying, did you go out there? Basically, when he's comparing it to John, he's saying, did you go out there to see a guy who had no backbone? Here's what I think of when I see this. You ever go to a car dealership or see the car dealership that has those blow-up things that like flop around like this all the time? That's what I think of. Like that's, he's saying, did you go around and see a man like that? No, he's like, no, you, you didn't. Uh, I, I love what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, John could never be compared to a reed shaken with wind, for he was strong, sturdy, firm, and steadfast. He was not like so many preachers today who are swayed by ever-changing opinion of the age and so proved themselves to be reed shaken with the wind. John was not like that. So Jesus said, hey, did you go see, uh, go out there in the wilderness to see a man who was, who was uh, shaken around? No. Then notice what he says next. He says in verse 24, or verse, excuse me, verse 25, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Behold, there are those who dress in splendid clothing and live in luxury in the king's court. He says next, what did you go see? Did you go see a man dressed, in other words, a man who like had everything put together, a man who had all the luxuries of life, a man who dwelled in the king's court, a man who uh, was, in a sense, the idea here is a man who was soft and pampered uh, by the king. He says, is that what you went to see? No, you didn't. Why? Because John was a man's man. I mean, what we know in scriptures, John's clothing were made of rough camel's hair. 
And most of us would be like, man, that, that is uncomfortable. That chafes, okay? And John, that's what John wore. He said, so what did you go out to see? See, the whole time, why is he asking these questions? Because he's looking at a group of people that just heard about John's doubt. And he's trying to get them to see that though John doubts, John is still a man worthy to follow. So what does he say next? Verse 26. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Ha, ah, we finally got it. And he says, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He says, what did you go out to see? He says, you went out to see a prophet. What, what's the importance of that? He's like, you went out to see a man who told you words that you wanted to hear. Powerful words, sometimes hard words. The point that Jesus was trying to make was it wasn't the messenger that attracted them to the wilderness, it was the message. And sometimes John's message angered people with God's truth. You know, John didn't buy into the seeker-sensitive model of ministry that we see today. He spoke strongly. And, and when John... Uh, was attacked, instead of uh, shirking away, he was emboldened to be more passionate to share his message. And so what he's saying here is in this passage is he's saying, John is one that's worthy to be praised because of what his message was. But secondly, he said, not only that, John is the fulfillment of the prophecies. John is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Look at verse 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare the way before you. Jesus goes beyond merely identifying him as a prophet. He is, uh, he is the one who was prophesied to come. Numerous places in the Old Testament, there are references to John as being the, the, one, the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who was going to prepare the way. And so he's saying there that he is, uh, because of that, he's fulfilling prophecies. And so though he may doubt... He's the one that was sent by God. Thirdly, John is blessed positionally by God. Look again in verse 28. I tell you, among those born of a woman, woman, there is none greater than John. And speaking of John the Baptist, he says there is, uh, specifically, he's talking about John as a prophet. So he's saying there, are, there is no greater prophet than he. Uh, and here, the, Jesus is speaking about the greatness of John's position what is the position? Well, we just read it in the previous verse. In the previous verse, the position was that he wasn't just an ordinary prophet. He was the prophet that was going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And so he's saying that because of that, there is none greater. Uh, John was one that was uh, looked up to because of that. No prophet had the privilege of being the forerunner of the Messiah. It does not mean that John had better character than any of the other Old Testament prophets, but only that the unique assignment of introducing the Lamb of God it was, was crucially important, and so therefore it was exalted. And so John is blessed. But then fourthly, I want to see this because this is a, this is a very interesting statement. Uh, at the end of verse 28, he says this, Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of like Jesus does a really great job here of building John up and then knocking him down at the same time. He's saying there's no greater prophet than John. And then he says this phrase, uh, Yes, but the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. You think, how is that possible? I mean, John is the who's who of God's servants. How can we, as the least of the kingdom, be greater than John? Let me tell you why. Because of the cross. Amen. And this is the beauty of it. See, John only announced that the king was coming. John only announced that the kingdom was uh, on its way. You and I are children of the kingdom and friends with the king. And that is the beauty of the cross. We're not greater in character than John. We're not greater in ministry than John. We're not greater in person than John. But we're greater in position. What does that mean? Because John was one of the last Old Testament saints. So he lived and died before the cross. 
But we, as New Testament saints, get to experience the beauty of the cross. And the beauty of the cross is that no matter how wicked of a person I am, no matter how wicked of a person you are, because of what Jesus Christ did, I am, I am righteous before God. This is the unbelievable thing about the cross. And our, our Lord's meaning in this expression appears to be simple. He declares that the righteous understanding of the least of the disciples who lived after the crucifixion and the resurrection would be far greater than that of John the Baptist who lived before the mighty events took place of Jesus Christ. Let's continue on talking about doubt. Doubt, as he said, will say, will lead to different responses to the message. Now look at verse 29 and 30. And you, if, if uh, many of your Bibles will probably have this, I know mine does. This 29 and 30 is in a parenthesis. Why is that there? Here's why. Because all we've had up to this point is Jesus speaking. And then it's kind of like 29 and 30 are uh, uh, writers, the writer interjects. Dr. Luke says, okay, let me pause here for a moment and tell you something. Let me pause and tell you kind of what's taking place in the circumstances around. Okay, so what does he say? Verse 29 and 30. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. See, what we have here is a difference of expectations between, between the, 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 the sinners and between the, um, the righteous, or, or I should say the religious of their day, the Pharisees. It's a difference of expectations of what is deserved. See, the Pharisees believe this. They believe because they obeyed the law. They believe because they did good works. They believe because they were moral people that they deserved God's acceptance and therefore they deserved heaven. And so it's talking about here this, this baptism. What was the idea of the baptism of John? Remember what John preached? John preached repentance. And then as an accompaniment to the repentance, when people would come in and repent, then John would baptize them. As, as a picture, just in the same way we do baptism, as a picture of repentance. And so when he's saying that, they, that the Pharisees rejected the baptism, what they were saying is, is we don't need to repent. We're good. I mean, we're, we're right before God because of all the good things we have done. And so what they're saying is, is they believe salvation was their right, that they didn't need to repent. On the other hand, the tax collectors or, or the sinners were very aware of their sin. And so, in fact, because of that, look what it says there. It says that they declared God just. What they're saying in that is they understood that they are sinners and that they needed to repent. And <clears throat> John's message was, if you don't repent, there's going to be judgment. And they're saying, hey, that's just of God to judge us. It's right. And they demonstrated repentance and faith, and they were baptized by John. And repentance always has evidence in their life. That the evidence was the baptism and the life that they lived. And maybe you're sitting here this morning like the Pharisees, and you believe that heaven is your right because of who you are. You believe that you should go to heaven because you're a good person. Maybe you think you should go to heaven because you're here in church today. Maybe you think it's a God-given right. You're a moral person. You're basically a nice person. Here's the reality that it's all hard for many people to swallow. Heaven is not your right. The only way into heaven is repent of your sins and accept that your only hope for heaven is Jesus' death on the cross. That is your only hope. It so saddens me when I hear people in the world who have want very little to do with Jesus Christ, and yet they will say, oh, some, they'll talk about being in heaven. Is this somehow they deserve it? 
because they've lived a moral life. The Bible says that none of us are good. In fact, it says that our our good things, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags, filthy, dirty, nasty rags. None of us are good. All of us need the grace of God. Finally, doubt will cause some to struggle with the messenger. Look at verse 31 through 35. This is an interesting section. It says, uh, it, it goes into something that is quite unique, and I'll, i got to explain it. Verse 31, to what then shall I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? What are the people today like? Look what he says. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We, pl- we sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come, eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Now, some, uh, I, I, I like the way John MacArthur says it here. He calls this the parable of the brats, okay? He's talking about the children, okay? And uh, he calls it the parable of the brats. Why? This, this uh, little... Uh, I'll call it a ditty, okay? This little uh, song in the verse 32 is a children's song that would, uh, was very common back then. And, and it was sung, and it, the idea was this, that, you couldn't, that no one was ever happy. It represents those who were never happy. Uh, you know, they're passive-aggressive in nature. The, the, uh, in, in the Jewish culture, the most, and we talked about this actually uh, last week, the most significant events in the Jewish culture were funerals and weddings, And so uh, funerals uh, were the dark and sad times. Weddings were the light and happy times. And and because it was what children saw a lot, when children got together to play, they would play funerals and weddings. Sounds weird, but that's what they would do. They would play funerals and weddings. And so this was a little song that was often sung, and it was a game that was often played. And uh, it's, it's actually interesting. This is the only record in Scripture of children playing a game. Uh, and they would play it in the marketplace. And understand this. The marketplace, kind of if you want to give a visual, visual in your head, imagine like a, like a flea market or a farmer's market type of thing. And uh, so there would be like tables and booths set up and there would be this open space and, and vendors would come and put their stuff there, but it wasn't always open. So when it wasn't open, it was just an area that had a lot of space. And so that would be often where the kids would go and play. And so they would go to the marketplace to play and they would play funerals and weddings. And, and there would be a group in there that would say, you know, I want to play wedding. And then there would be another group that would say, I want to play funeral. One group would say, well, we don't want to play wedding because it's too happy. I mean, you see that uh, in in the first part there. We we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. I mean, we're playing it, we're having this, but you're not involved. And then then there was a group that would say, um, uh, we we, we wanted to play funeral. Uh, We don't want to play funeral because it's too sad. And what he's saying here in this, he's saying, remember, he's describing the generation that they lived in. And he's saying, similarly, there are those who, who liked John the Baptist or didn't like John the Baptist because he was too serious. You see that there. John the Baptist comes, and he doesn't eat bread. He doesn't drink wine. You say he's got a demon. There's something wrong with him. On the other hand, there was those who didn't like Jesus because... Essentially, they felt like he had too many parties. I mean, look what it says. Jesus says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. You say, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's too frivolous. He has too many celebrations. And what Jesus is saying is you can't have it both ways. Just like you can't fight over who's going to, whether you're going to play funeral or wedding. And I think the same thing is true today. There are some who will say about a church, oh, you know, you talk too much about sin in your church. That's depressing. Or others will say, oh, you're, you're too upbeat. 
that you need to be more serious, more traditional. And basically what the idea here is people reject truth because it's not in the package they want. And Jesus calls them out and calls them a bunch of spiritual children. Remember, this is the parable of the brats. And I think oftentimes criticism and why John was criticized and why Jesus was criticized is because oftentimes criticism is a way to cover our our conviction. And those who reject the message will find fault or excuse in, in not believing and receiving Jesus. Then he ends there with that, uh, an interesting, it's a Hebrewism, like a Hebrew phrase in verse 35. He says, yet wisdom is justified by her children. It is j- just a way of saying this, that uh, Jesus' illustration points out that there are two kinds of spiritual children in every generation, the ones of foolishness and the ones of wisdom. And the foolish reject the message and are devoid of wisdom. The wise are redeemed. And they accept the message and they repent of their sins and they're transformed. Simply, Jesus is kind of giving a a conclusion at the end and saying, which one are you? So, in conclusion of our message here, Jesus gave John the benefit of the doubt despite the fact that he doubted. And the same thing goes for us. Go back to the beginning when I asked about, do you ever doubt God? And I listed a bunch of those doubts. Maybe you're in here today and you are struggling with doubt. I guarantee you're not alone. I guarantee there are many others. My guess is it's a pretty high percentage. If you're struggling with doubt, then how do you handle doubt? What I want to do is just give some practical tips in the last few minutes of dealing with doubt. First one. Admit your doubt and ask for help. Admit your doubt and ask for help. That's what John did. That's what John did. And here's the reality. God's not fragile. I mean, if, if uh, I get home today, my wife walks up to me and, and she sits down next to me and says, I need to talk to you because I'm doubting you right now. I mean, I would, I would like crumble. What? what? What do you mean you're doubting me? What did I do wrong? I, 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 you know, God's not like that. You go to God and say, God, I'm doubting. He, he doesn't sit there and crumble. I know. Numerous places in the Bible, we see men and women who struggle with doubt. I love the story of Asaph, the musician, who who comes before God and he says, God, I look out in the world and what I see is sinful prosper. And and us that are trying to follow you are, are constantly put under. We're constantly put down. And he's like, what's the point? And then he says this, but then I came to the house of God. I came to God's presence. And God can handle our doubts. God can handle our unanswered questions. God is big. Here's the reality. God runs the universe without any help from you and I. And so your doubts won't upset him. Tell him your doubts. Cry out to him. Secondly, and this is a big one, be consistently in the word. Romans 10, 17 says, which I I put as our memory verse for this week, is so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. How are you going to have faith in what God says? It's by being in his word. Do you know why some have weak faith? Because they hardly read the Bible. Do you know why some doubt and doubt and doubt and never ever get victory of their doubts? Sometimes it's because they never read the Bible. Now, I believe there are Christians who read the Bible consistently and still struggle with doubt. I do. Reading God's love letter every day is a powerful protection against doubt. Thirdly, this is an important one. Act on your faith, not on your doubt. It's what Noah did when he built the ark. 
It's what David did when he faced Goliath. It's what Daniel did when he was thrown into the lion's den. Don't you think for a minute that any of those heroes didn't, that none of those heroes struggled with doubts? I believe every one of them probably did. In fact, we know Noah struggled with doubt. I mean, for, for a long time, he sat there and uh, meticulously built an ark. And I'm sure every day when he grabbed his hammer and he grabbed a nail, okay, that's not how he did it exactly, maybe, but, uh, and he started building it and he sat there and going, why am I doing this, God? Why am I doing this, God? God, why am I doing this? But he didn't act on his doubt. He acted on his faith. Did he have doubt? Oh, guaranteed. Fourthly, doubt your doubt, not your faith. That's kind of a flip of the last one, but I think it's important for us to see. Cling to your faith even when you're in deep valleys of darkness. All of us are going to walk through valleys of darkness. All of us are going to find at times when, when, man, we don't even know what's up and what's down. When you find yourself in a valley where all is uncertain, and when you're tempted to give into your doubt, keep going. Keep going. Your doubt is not from God. So continue on, and don't, don't uh, sit there and think, oh, I'm not sure, nope, nope. This, this doubt over here is not okay. And continue on. And then finally, Keep going back to what you know is true. I I love the Apostle Paul. When he got towards the end of his life, I mean, think about all Paul went through. He was persecuted. He was beaten. He was in prison. He was shipwrecked. He was uh, physically, emotionally, verbally abused on a regular basis. And he gets to the end of his life, and he's writing to his, his young apprentice, Timothy, and he says to Timothy this phrase, he says, I know whom I have believed. I know. When you are at times of doubt, here's my suggestion, is go back to what you know is certain. You know what? Maybe you're here today and and you're in that stage of, man, I have cancer, I have a family member's cancer, and God, I don't understand why. Go back to the God's word and, and read where it says, where it tells us that God is sovereign. God is in control. I don't understand that. I doubt that, God, but I know you are still God. I know that. When you're going through those times of doubt, go and find God's word and say, God, I don't understand all of this around me. Maybe even a time when you're struggling with your salvation, you're saying, God, I just don't know. Here's, here's my, my take on people who struggle with their salvation. Majority of the time, I think it's um, the struggling with their salvation is actually evidence that they care about it. Instead of like, you know, people who, you know, want to reject God, they're not sitting at home struggling and with doubt about their salvation. And so when you're struggling with doubt about your salvation, go back again to the word. I know Jesus Christ died on the cross. I know I am a sinner. I absolutely know my only hope for heaven is Jesus. That's what I know. I'm struggling, God. But I know. Here's the reality is God is bigger than our doubts. And he will never turn an honest doubter away. And like John the Baptist, who struggled with doubt, Jesus, are you the one or are we still looking for someone else? Jesus gives John the benefit of the doubt. So come to him with your doubts, your skepticism, your unbelief, your hard questions, your uncertainty. He welcomes them. Pour your heart out before God. Let's pray. God, I do pray that you will work in our hearts. Lord, I know in my own life, even, even this week, there were times when I, I struggled with doubt. 
I had questions that I had to bring before you. And sometimes I don't find the answers I want, but I know you still hear me. Lord, I know right now in this room, there are many in here who are struggling with doubt. Maybe it's those big why questions of life. They don't know why these circumstances have come into their life. They don't know why the hardships have come. Lord, I pray that you will help them to come to you, ask for the answers, and then search your word. Maybe there are those who are doubting their salvation. I pray that they also will get back into the word. Maybe there's those that are just general intellectual doubts, times when they struggle to understand if the Bible is reliable. I pray that you'll help them to trust in what they know is true. Our doubt is not from you. But you are willing to become face-to-face with us in our doubts. So I pray that you'll help us to be honest. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me. We get to share in communion together this morning. Before we do that... Let's rehearse some of these truths of the gospel by singing this song together, All I Have is Christ. We're going to take a few moments here and um, participate in the Lord's Supper. And as I was, I was sitting over here reminding uh, myself of uh, what we're going to look at here, I'm reminded of the reason why we can trust in God is because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And the purpose of this Lord's Supper is to continue to remind ourselves of that so that maybe this week you've struggled with doubt. And take the time to reflect on what Jesus Christ did for you. He said, and in, in, uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, For I received the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, we are thankful 
uh, for the work of Christ on the cross. It is because of that that we have hope, and that is our only means of attacking doubt. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us to trust in what Jesus did on the cross. I pray you'll also right now allow us to reflect on our own lives and, and to address sin that may be in our lives and to uh, repent before you and to come clean of the sin that is there. We thank you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask our deacons to stand and they're going to distribute the bread. Eat in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, I pray you help us as we distribute the cup that will remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And I ask the deacons to stand and we'll distribute the cup.
drink in remembrance of Christ. God, we are thankful for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, that the, the good news will change not just our eternal destiny, but our everyday life. And so I pray that we'll walk out of here ready to serve you and share the good news with others. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor Will. Go ahead and join me one last time in standing. We'll sing the final verse of All I Have is Christ. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of being able to celebrate communion together. Lord, as we close our corporate worship to you this morning, Lord, we pray for guidance in the matters at hand, Lord, and we ask you to show us clearly how to go about our lives when it comes to doubt. The fact that we all face doubt from time to time, it takes different, many different forms and many different faces. Lord, let us face it head on, Lord, not trusting in our doubts, but trusting in Jesus above our doubts. Lord, we, take, we trust that you will lead us as we seek to lead and love our families and those around us and show the light of Christ this week. And it's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll have a short announcement video and then you'll be dismissed. Hey, First Baptist family. Glad you joined us for worship this morning. Let me give you a few announcements and then I'll let you go. First of all, the Young at Heart is having a game night this Friday night here at the church building, 6 p.m. So anyone 55 or older are welcome to join the Young at Heart game night this Friday at 6 p.m. Also, the women's coffee that meets once a month usually meets at Martin's on Ironwood. However, this week they're going to meet at 10 a.m. right here in the church building this upcoming Saturday. So don't go to Martin's. Come here to the church, ladies, 10 a.m., morning coffee with a special emphasis because it's Christmas. Now, one other announcement that I want to make sure everyone's aware of, something, a ministry that's going to be beginning in the new year in January is a Mommy and Me program. Now, this is a time where the moms with younger children in the church can get together once a month on a Saturday morning and go through the journey of motherhood together. Now, I know you're wondering, I will not be running the Mommy and Me ministry. That's actually going to be Lindsay Pachesney. So, if you want to know more information, you can come talk to me, but you can also go to Lindsay Bachesney and she'd be able to answer any questions for you about the upcoming Mommy and Me ministry that's going to be beginning. Now, my last announcement is actually a ministry opportunity that I would like for some of you to begin praying about, specifically the ladies in the church. Now, many of you know that for a while now, we've had Impact Basketball, that's a ministry to teen guys in the community where we open up the gym, they come in, play some ball, we have a Bible talk, and we kind of introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God, slowly but with intention. Now we've had some ladies take an interest in wanting to start 
a girls impact, not necessarily bent towards sports, but a ministry to teen girls in our community here in Mishawaka. Now, this would be a really awesome opportunity for a much needed area of ministry to teen girls here in Mishawaka. All we need is people. So if this is something that maybe you want to start praying about, or maybe God has already started to impress this desire on your heart to reach the teen girls around Mishawaka, come and talk to me. We have a few ideas swirling around. We want to get things started as soon as possible, but we also want to be intentional about how we form this ministry. So come talk to me if you have an interest in it, and we'll make something happen. That's it for my announcements today. Hey, if this is your first time joining us here at First Baptist, thanks for choosing to worship with us. Make sure to stop by our guest center in the annex. You'll find a gift mug set out just for you. First Baptist family, have a blessed week.